Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Chris Washburn. I'm the chair of the music department, uh, but also I like to pride myself in being Mike Shadlin's partner in crime, or partner in jazz. And um, uh, we're so pleased to be here. Uh, we started the Artists in Residence um, uh, th two years, three years ago, and this is our, our second Artists in Residence. And many of you know his name and have seen him in Zoom. Um, but he's even greater in person, and this is the first time we've had an event to actually bring him here in person, and we're delighted to have him here. This Artist in Residence program, as many of you know, is um, something that's uh, really a dream come true in the sense of bringing great jazz uh, to the Zuckerman and then also for inspiration in neuroscience that works both ways in both directions. And so we all hope that you get a chance um, to talk to Miguel and to share some ideas. Uh, he's one of the most amazing musicians I know, and it's such a pleasure to have him here. So today, we're going to hear a lot of music. We thought music is the best way to start this uh, year off. I think we all need it. It's one of the things that's, that's probably the best communal glue in the world. It's also a way of bringing people together. And then there's going to be a little bit of uh, talk about the brain. Uh, with uh, Mike will come up and, and, and talk and we'll share some ideas. There'll be some more music, but there'll be a chance to answer uh, to ask questions and get them answered by Mike and Miguel. And also, afterwards, there will be a reception right on the lovely terrace, and you're all welcome to come and uh, have uh, uh, continue the conversation um, there. For those of you that don't know, uh, Miguel is a... Uh, a multiple Grammy nom uh, nominee. He's a recipient of both the Guggenheim and also the MacArthur Fellow, as well as uh, one of the most innovative saxophonists on the scene in the jazz world. He has, is it 14 or 15 albums now? 14? 14 albums. Many of them are uh, just out of this world, so I hope that you buy in bulk, download in bulk, uh, all of his uh, his works. He's uh, originally from Puerto Rico, and he's dedicated a lot of his educational uh, energies to not only teaching at Manhattan School of Music and New England Conservatory, but also starting programs in Puerto Rico and uh, bringing concerts to places that oftentimes don't have jazz concerts. He can talk to you a little bit more about that. He's also brought him with him a partner, a wonderful Venezuelan pianist, Luis Perdomo. Both of them reside in New York City, and Luis has been here, for, I think, for about 28 years. I first met him and played with him right when he first came, and he really impressed me, and I knew he was going to be one of the most in-demand pianists. So you're in for a real treat. They're going to play some duo. And also, of course, I want to introduce Mike Shadlin, who will also join them and lead the discussion, a great jazz musician in his own right. So please welcome Louis and Miguel Zinan to the stage. And we hope you enjoy.
Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here and great to have you all here. Finally, uh, making some music in this big in this uh, great uh, building, and, and very, very help, very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, you're listening to Mr. Luis Perdomo on the piano. Luis Perdomo. <laughs> Um, so we played a couple tunes in a row. That last one was a tune by the great Donald Bird uh, called Fly Little Bird. Before that, we played an original, Ojelo. And we started off uh, with a piece of music by one of our heroes, the great Jerry Gonzalez from the Bronx. Uh, that one was called Los Roncos. And now we're going to bring up our, our partner in crime, really the uh, engineer for, for all these events happening here. Mike Shatlin to uh, talk a little bit about music and other stuff. Mike. Well, thanks, you guys. Uh, and uh, Luis should feel, feel, feel free to chime in whenever he feels like it as well. Uh, yeah, please. So, Miguel, d what a delight to have you here. <laughs> thanks. Uh, it's it's thanks. such a treat. Great to get to play. So let's, um, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to go on and on about anything. I think we're going to have a dialogue and have a conversation about jazz and a little bit of brain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, a lot of us feel that we study the brain for a reason. We, you know, we study the brain because we'd like to make patients better. We'd like to understand how the mind works. And basically, there, there are as many reasons as there are probably are people in this room. But I think we can all recognize that uh, what, the, what is really a celebration of the mind is art. And of the arts, I think jazz improvisation makes, it, brings that, uh, makes that clearest. That um, the things that we do when our minds are fit, the things that we do with our minds when we are at our most creative, are what you guys just did a moment ago. And um, so let's, uh, I, think, I think we can dig down a little deeper than that, you know, that's the high level, but um, you know, what goes on in the mind of a musician when you guys are playing and how does it work? And uh, let's talk about it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, from, from just from, from the perspective of this specific sort of environment, I mean, Luis and I, we've been playing together for a very, very long time, uh, maybe 99, something like that, right? Uh, so, you know, in different configurations and different, you know, quartet, duo, other bands with other folks. So, you know, one of the things that I like to think of when, when playing with another musicians is this aspect of, of just kind of like a, like a common language, like this certain familiarity, which kind of has different levels. You know, I mean, there's a there's sort of like an overall language when you're playing this music and improvised music, especially jazz. Like even if I if we and I hadn't played ever played before. I mean, we still know the same tunes, and you know, we're following the same kind of chord progression, and, and there are certain things that are in common. Uh, but I think when when playing together for a long time, it, it, there's another level to that, like a so certain, of course, a, a lot of familiarity, but also, like you know, we can anticipate things happening, and we can kind of foresee what the other one's gonna do, and we could accommodate to that. And and I think that, you know, that's that's something that that definitely goes goes on while we're playing this this comfort level but at the same time it's like okay so i'm familiar enough with this person that i'm i'm kind of i i, I kind of know his language and at the same time i can take more risk because he's going to be able to react to things that i that i do in a way that someone else might not you know and then the other thing is is playing in this format playing duo uh you know there's a certain um uh you know there there's you, we play a lot of quartet with bass and drums, Luis and I, you know, with uh, some friends of ours. And, and uh, when playing this music, especially for Luis, you know, there's more responsibility, obviously, because he, he is basically the rhythm section. But even for myself, uh, playing in this context, there's, you know, there, there's a certain level of awareness and a certain level of, uh, of, um, of responsibility that's different than playing in other contexts, you know. Uh, and I mean, we, I could I could go even farther than that. We never played in this room before, so even playing in this room and reacting to the sound, reacting to you guys and the vibes that we're getting from you, so that affects us and kind of like, you know, kind of plays in our minds, saying, okay, so maybe we should put this things this way or push things another way. So, a lot of lot of levels, you know. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of levels, I mean, there's a sort of. Um 
uh, it's sort of two ways of thinking about music in some sense. There's the harmonic movement of tunes, and, you know, like the chords that are changing and, and, um, and, the, and the cycle of the songs, that, like that one but like, it was basically, a, as I've heard it, a four-bar phrase that over and over. Yeah, it's kind of like eight bars. That eight. The 16 bars and the first eight are, um, the f they're kind of similar, kind of similar, but 16 bars. Yeah. And yet every time it's different. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. I love when you guys were trading, whether it was four or eights, whatever, mm -hmm. it was going back and forth and, and uh, each of you sort of playing off of each other. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was the, sometimes it's the sound, it's the tonality that right. was sort of, uh, uh, and sometimes it was a whole, Phrase or a kind of a rhythmic motif, and and uh, it was just uh, I'd like to hear you t uh, think a little, just riff a little bit about what w at what point in time do you kind of seize on? Oh, that's 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 where I want to go. There's my idea. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, you, uh, there's a lot of musicians here, and I know, I know you you're you're a musician as well, Mike, and, and you're an improviser as well. Uh, so one of the things that that when playing this music for a long time. You know, there's always a point when you're gonna you're gonna say, okay, so maybe in the next in the next couple bars, I'm gonna play. I want to play this, or this might be nice, or this might sound good, or this might create an effect. And then within that, those couple of beats going on, then it's your decision if you really want to go there or not. You know, uh, uh, a lot of times for myself, I li I usually discard those those. Uh, uh, those ideas, you know, like like if, there, if there's something that's planned, I usually kind of discard it and, and want to get closer to the moment to kind of get like a little something a little fresher, you know. Uh, uh, so that that's 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 definitely something that's going on, especially when we trade, because a lot of times, like if he's playing something, uh, I'm listening, of course, to what he's playing, but I might be thinking, okay, so I want to play this the next time around. But as we're getting closer, he might play, he might play something that might, might okay. So I should play something off that, you know, or I could play something like rhythmically or something totally different, or like you know, kind of taking another in another direction. So in a way, is this sort of like conversation back and forth? But we're kind of like like you said, you know, we're playing over this harmonic structure and trying to deal with that, or trying to keep time and all this stuff. Uh, so it's 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 a balance of like your own kind of ideas versus the ideas that you're getting from the other person and, and trying to make it into a back and forth, you know? Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, let's talk about time just a little bit. Uh -huh. So the, there is this sense in which the conversation with each other and with the listener sort of takes place on multiple time scales. There's uh -huh. those, you know, there's the phrases, but then there's the, the many choruses. Uh -huh. And so there's a, there, to me, uh, what's most exciting about um, uh, some of your playing in particular, mm -hmm. um, but just the greats in general, is the, the way that um, you establish in this listener, and I think many of us, the a sense of where this might go, like a, a narrative over many courses, but at the same time, the little tension and release over just a bar or something. And I, yeah. I just wonder how much you, um, you just instinctively feel that, or and uh, and uh, at one day I'd love to know how you actually learn it. But, <laughs> but let's not do that. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's a lot of a lot of it is is sort of reacting to the moment, but also, I mean, and Luis will tell you the same thing. Uh, when you play music for a long time and you play this music for a long time and you get familiar with certain things and certain situations, um, I mean, a lot of times I like to think about this this situation, right, when we're playing and we're improvising. It's easy to get lost in, in your own kind of world, right, in your own creative world because you're dealing with a lot of different things. You know, like you said, you're dealing with bars and you're dealing with chords and you're dealing with melody and you're dealing with form and you're trying to listen to the other person and at the same time you're trying to be creative. So it's, it's easy to like just kind of like get caught on that little space that's just within you. Uh, and a lot of times what I like to think of, especially like I said, after playing for a long time and you get a little more comfortable, is to really kind of let that go and just like look at it from a wider perspective, almost like a, from an outside perspective as a listener and thinking, okay, so why, what did I just play like, you know, a chorus ago or, or, or two bars ago or four bars ago, right? And how can I make that kind of coherent and non-repetitive and, and, and fresh and logical and all those things. So you, I mean, I feel that with time, musicians like 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 Luis and musicians that that are more experienced, you're able to have this kind of wider perspective uh, uh, in terms of what's happening creatively, you know, 
and are able to have a little more control. I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Have a little more control in terms of how you shape things in the in the in the short run and in the long run. So I would I guess I'd like to cap this part of the discussion off by saying that that you know in in, in a sense all of um, knowledge, all of the things we know, whether we're talking about medicine or mathematics or jazz, is effectively an answer to the questions that our brains pose to the world, and we get back answers. And I think it's a, that's an important insight about the organization of thought in the brain. And what makes jazz special and art in general, I would say, is um, the ability of the artist to imbue in the beholder some sense of expectation, some sense of where we're going, and be a little bit teased, perhaps, before yeah. actually getting getting the goods. Um, yeah. And so there, we we're sort of celebrating what a thought is in, in general. I think. Yeah, and that's a great way way to put it. This this idea of like teasing or anticipation, you know, just to, to like keep your ear kind of there. I mean, for for us, when we listen to music and the stuff that we like, that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for that 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 risk factors like what what's going to happen even if you know the tune and you heard it many times it's like okay what's going to happen now and those moments where like you get something unexpected are, are really the moments that kind of like wake you up you know exactly. get your attention back which was occasionally you did that just straight with the time itself mm -hmm. and also uh, also with the uh, the harmonies yeah so do we do we want to get some questions paula do people want to ask questions anybody here or on the live stream have a question about music, about the brain? Well, we've, we've talked a lot about the music, Mike. So what's happening in the brain um, when we're operating on those multiple time scales, do you think? Like what's happening when we're like keeping that bigger picture and also paying attention to those smaller things? What happens when our attention gets grabbed? Uh, I, I think that the the I would say the archetype or the core of all of the aesthetic is that anticipation that uh, Miguel's talking about and and a little violation thereof, and um, and so we we see it, it, the brain of of animals and us that are not beholden to immediate changes in the world learn to anticipate those changes and what we do with time of course is anticipate the beat. Or anticipate the pulse, which is you know the the broader level of beats, and uh, and and dance, yeah. And so uh, is that what you're, <laughs> you're signaling to me? No, just to speak me? into your microphone a little oh, more. Oh, oh, sorry. Perfect. <laughs> and, and, and so that's what that meant. Okay. You guys uh, can't see me signaling to Mike to lift his no, microphone. No, I had no up. idea. I had no idea. So I. <laughs> But the, yeah, I mean, the, so I think the brains of all animals and also we can think of if children learning, us learning a new fact, less doing mathematics is a sense of, uh, a sense of getting, first of all, learning what questions to ask of the world, including, and, 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 and in this case, we hear something, some f thing going in triplets when it was the beat was bop, 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 and da, 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 da off of that. We, we're sitting there waiting for, oh, this thing is coming around, this thing's coming, whoa, it didn't really come around, it came across, and it like resolved you know, you know, six cycles later. And so that, that's what's going on in our minds, I think, is what goes on when you just anticipate your alarm clock or anticipate the, the ding of the bell uh, you know, coming in, in any moment. Those things are boring, but when we're involved in a communication with the artist, who is taking us to have those, giving us, the, imbuing those expectations. Our brains are doing sort of the same thing, but we just kind of enjoy the shock to it or the, or, or the teasing. Awesome, thanks. Uh, yeah, Rui, and then I'll repeat it for the live stream audience. Rui. Uh -huh. Hi. Hi, Miguel. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I would be interested about your philosophy about
So just, just for our live stream audience, that was a great question that I'm going to try and sum up really badly <laughs> uh, about, about the subjective experience for the, for the artists themselves, for you, Miguel, about uh, how you, I guess, integrate all of this information and all of the sounds and experiences that you're getting while you're playing. Yeah, that's a great question, Rui, and it's great to see you here, man. It's been a, it's been a while. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. That, that's a great question because it kind of, it in many ways, it describes, at least in, in, in my perspective, like the, the practice sort of process, you know. Uh, when, uh, when you're dealing with an instrument, you know, like you said, there's this sort of physical thing that's connected to the instrument where you have to kind of learn how to, how to manage it, to kind of, you know, to learn, learn how to produce a sound and learn how to play the notes and how to do that in time and in tune and with a good tone. And there's so many things that that have to happen before you even create music, right? It's kind of like you're, you're kind of like setting yourself up with a platform. Uh, and that takes a long time, you know, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll say that that's most of what I practice and I'll be pretty confident to say that that's most of what Luis practices also. So just trying to stay on top of the instrument because this is our vehicle. Right. But then, like you said, there's also the creative side of, of what we do, which we also practice. Right. And it's ways to practice that to kind of train yourself to uh, a specific situation, like creating obstacles or playing tunes in different keys or different meters or different tempos or or thinking about, you know, what would happen. And, and if this happened, then my, I might play this. Or a lot of times you, you emulate someone else's playing, like you copy a. a um, improvisation or solo or, or a tune and that's kind of how you build yourself up to have more of a more control right over what, about what what's happening sort of creatively if you will and then like you mentioned there's like this outside factor of the audience right and and uh and you know it's it's interesting because um during this time during the, the COVID when we weren't playing in front of people. We did a lot of playing, some playing, you know, Louise and I duo. And, you know, we played kind of like we, what, the way we play now. But it just felt super weird, you know, not only because people weren't clapping or, or breathing or whatever, but it was, it's just like this idea of like not having someone in front of you listening, even if that person was totally muted and like quiet and didn't clap at all. Uh, there's uh, there's this thing like there's someone else right there standing in front of you listening to you and it influences what you're doing whether you want it or not right so that's another thing and with audiences it could go many different ways you could get audiences that are super into it and 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 you know like they'll be super like interactive and that could be positive and negative sometimes too you know uh, and then you could get the opposite which also can be positive and negative depending on the situation you know depending on the music you're playing and depending on the mood you're in you know and where the music is going so i mean there's so many things like you said that go into it but i feel that that at least if, from my perspective they're all kind of connected and they're all kind of uh they definitely affect the way the way you play, uh, and as musicians, I would say the thing with the, like putting the instrument, working on the instrument, and working on the creative, that's something that you can practice at home. Dealing with this interaction with the audience, that's something that just comes from experience. You can't practice that, right? That just you just ca got, have to do it and get to a point where you experience uh, what that feels like, and then you learn from that, and that's that's kind of the practice. Thank you, man. That's a great question. Thank you. Can I? Can I um, put that in a kind of a neuroscience -y way for us, too? So um, starting with the horn, the instrument, I'm thinking of a point I once heard Kerry James Marshall, the great American painter, make about what he termed mastery. He spells it without the E to sort of divorce the word from, from slavery. And, and the idea is that, is that when we develop those tools, when we develop the ability to speak, when we develop the, the ability to move in a certain way, we understand the world differently because we interrogate it with the, through the eyes of the artist, through the eyes of the tool, through the eyes of the art of the brush that you've learned to use in a certain way. So I think we know the world differently in accordance with the mastery that we um, cultivate in the instrument. I'm, I don't really mean me. But I mean these guys. So um, <laughs> then, so then to the other point, which is the the sort of inter the interhuman part, that social part. So I I think that's the key to, uh, you know, when I think about art as as uh, celebrating our cognition, the key to consciousness even, 
is a world that we create not just to move things about, walk between, um, uh, spit on, whatever, you know, eat, mate with, whatever are the things we do as animals in the world with direct intentions. But one of the things that we do that's very beautiful is um, communicate with the mind of another that we think has a mind somewhat like ours, respecting the idea that it's not exactly like it. And in that, I think we, the, 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 the objects of the world suddenly have a presence in the world that's independent of us. They have a life of their own, and that's the nature of consciousness for us. It's just like reaching for things, except it's reaching for another in a kind of way. And, um, and, and I think that's what Miguel's getting at. And I think, you, I don't know if you, how many of you have given talks over Zoom over the last 18 months, but I've, I, my experience has been that you, that, that I, even if I'm looking at, s it, the, the lack of being able to see someone in the audience means I forget to say things I would have normally said because they're just sort of not there for me. And even if someone's just dead bored out of their mind and not giving me anything back, you know, real audience, I, 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 my mind goes to, oh yeah, I better explain that graph, that axis there, because I think they might have missed it or something. So anyway, so that's a part of what we're doing too, I think, is that, that interaction all the time. So again, as magical as it seems what you guys are doing, it's the same, I think, as what we all do in our daily lives with others when we're trying to express ideas and tell stories. Should we turn back to the music? Well, we still have a few minutes. Yeah. Um, how are we doing with time, Paula? Maybe one more, you think? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we could do one more if we have a burning question. Um, but I mean, but I, 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 think, I guess I, mean, I meant in terms of music, should we play? I think uh, we definitely have time for, uh, for one or two more pieces cool. of music. Great. So why don't, why don't we do that? We're all Great. here to listen all to right. some music. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Luis, Luis Perdomo, Miguel Zanon. Thank you. Thank you so much for gracing our institute. And thank you all for coming.